All right, so thank you for being here for the absentee landlord webinar today. Um, I'm Carrie Gatto and I'm CEO of Big Picture Realty, which is a team of Keller Williams. And as your local realtor, I'm your partner in achieving financial freedom through real estate. No one succeeds alone. And when you have a great team around you, you definitely accelerate your success. So today I have an expert panel specifically curated for absentee landlords to grow and manage their portfolios. And I will introduce them all in just a moment. Um, I did wanna let you know that we are recording the webinar today and I will send out the recording via an email to everyone who has registered for the webinar. Um, and then I'll also put our contact, our contact information for all the panelists in that email. And panelists, I'd also ask you if you wanna share your contact information now in the chat, that would be great so people have it available and handy. Um, and I have gone ahead and, and muted everyone just so there's less background noise, but I definitely encourage your questions. So please go ahead and use the chat box um, and put your questions there and we'll have time to answer them at the end if they don't get answered throughout the presentation. And if you don't mind, um, go ahead and feel free to put in the chat for the attendees whether or not you already own um, investment properties and that will just help us get to know the audience a little bit. You can just answer yes or no. Thank you so much. All right, so um, since you're here, you likely already know the power of real estate investing for financial independence. And whether you are just starting out or are already an experienced investor, the content today will be extremely helpful. Um, so some of the topics we're going to cover today are if you're moving out of the area, should you hold or sell your investment property? Who can you rely on to cost-effectively manage your properties to make them a truly passive investment? In the current market, is it a good time to buy, hold, or sell? <clears throat> what numbers do you need to analyze in order to make the most informed decisions? What other investment opportunities might be available to you around real estate investing that you haven't yet explored? And if you decide to do this, how can you best prepare and make it the most profitable experience possible? And can you retire when you want using real estate as part of your overall investment strategy? And to help answer those questions, here is today's panel, who are all key players to have on your team. First, we'll hear from Jamie Thompson, who is a property manager and rental agent. He's going to talk about how he takes the stress out of real estate and makes it a truly passive investment. And then I will talk about the sales market right now and how to maximize your profit during ownership and if you sell. And then Wolfgang Cease is a specialist in Delaware State Trusts or DSTs. And he'll talk about an investment opportunity that you might not have considered related to minimizing tax exposure in real estate investing. Emily Clare is a financial advisor with Edward Jones. She will help you plan and organize your finances for any kind of investment decision. And Sarah Hartline of Margolis and Bloom is an estate attorney and is here to help you understand the legal ramifications of your real estate holdings on your estate. Wait, sorry, I'm just letting a couple more people in. Okay. So um, with that, success in real estate necessitates having a great team. For absentee landlords, a great property manager allows you to leverage your time by taking the tenant hassles off your plate. So you can scale your portfolio. And Jamie does an amazing job for his clients. So Jamie, over to you. Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm getting a disabled screen sharing. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna give you a quick update on the market, uh, what we've been seeing. Uh, we are based out of Medford, just north of Boston, and we do service what I call Woburn to the Water and Boston to 95. So effectively the Middlesex and Northern Suffolk area. 
these numbers are based on Middlesex. Uh, Suffolk is very similar. Uh, so we're definitely seeing uh, inventory get consumed at this point. Uh, beginning of the year is very difficult. Uh, the inventory was very high after COVID. Um, we are seeing the market come back. We're seeing inventory getting picked off now pretty consistently. Um, although prices are down uh, on average across the market, we're seeing about a still a five to 10%, depending on the cities that the units are in uh, for consumption for this year. We do expect to get back to market rents, hopefully by the end of next season, so September of next year. Um, <clears throat> so inventory compared to last year, it's actually pretty interesting. These are based on MLS numbers, is actually down uh, compared to last year, which is good. We're seeing uh, absorption rate is definitely increasing uh, as we get closer to the September 1 date. Uh, days on market is up from last year, which with COVID is not surprising. Uh, we are seeing that absorption rate over the past two months has gotten a very, uh, seen an increase in absorption. Uh, units are closing a lot quicker now. Um, we had a lot of shoppers for a couple of months. Um, and then that absorption rate obviously has been climbing steadily for the past two months. So we're seeing the inventory that's in the market being consumed by people looking for that September 1 deadline. So from a rental market update perspective, uh, market impacts, again, COVID was a big impact for inventory. People moved out of the area. Um, larger units, uh, three, four, five bedrooms saw a lot of turnover where people were, you know, groups were splitting up and reducing the number of people they were living with. Uh, work from home has been a driver from that as well. Uh, a lot of people moved out of the Boston area because the you know, restaurants and activities weren't available to them. And we're starting to see that develop back up this year as businesses are starting to come into the city again, requiring people to come back into work. But I don't see that's gonna really recover until uh, next season. Uh, rent prices are recovering. They are not down as far as they were. We saw in some areas they were down as much as 15% uh, with markets uh, absorption rates at the beginning of the year. Uh, those have definitely recovered. We're seeing trends towards market rates Again, September 1, some areas, you know, 5%. I'm not seeing the 10% anymore, um, except in some of the student markets, they're still trying to fill the units. Uh, also from a behaviors perspective and a marketing, we are still seeing landlords that are paying a full fee up front for the brokerage fee. And in some cases, I'm seeing bonuses to agents being offered by companies that are managing property in order to you know, bring in volume for those properties. Uh, the eviction moratoriums, uh, the mass state for moratorium ended last October. Uh, we are now covered by the CDC moratorium, which is, was extended to July 30th. Have not seen any updates on that, but um, that's been, there's been a couple of court cases that have uh, been addressing that, uh, pushing to remove it. And so that's been kind of a juggle. Uh, we uh, assistance programs, RAFT again has been upgraded to $10,000 and the uh, Federal Emergency Rental Assistance Program just went live in Massachusetts last month. So we're seeing additional funds available to tenants and landlords from there. So from property management perspective, our priority is taking the stress out of real estate. Uh, your volume of activities that you have to do with property, with finances, tenants, maintenance are pretty uh, all encompassing, can take up a lot of your time. Our priority from a rental management perspective is to take that off your hands, free up your time so you can dedicate your valuable time to more valuable activities or more enjoyable activities. Uh, so our focus again, tenant activities, general maintenance, repairs, monthly expense management, contractor management, long-term improvements, or what I call depreciable investments. Yeah. Or expenses. The kind of, the kind of money is going to pay. Uh, and also rentals. So turnover of the units and screenings and our asset of market knowledge. So you've got a lot of activities that go into managing a rental on a day-to-day -day basis and then turnovers being a uh, big activity right now. Uh, next item is gonna be uh, optimize your return on investment. Once the timeline and the activities that are streamlined for managing your property, you're gonna to start to focus on minimizing your expenses and improving your units to get market rents uh, the return on your property is based on those two numbers, the, what you're collecting for income and what your expenses are. Uh, for that rent number, location, 
uh, for a little while was not the priority. That is starting to come back up as people are looking at the commute, the train lines. Uh, you've got the development of the green line going to College Ave, a uh, lot of activity on the blue line lately, and uh, the orange line going into Boston. Uh, number of bedrooms and layout has been a big driving factor for rent. The more bedrooms, the more rent you can charge. Uh, however, as we get into larger units, we're seeing uh, they're staying on market longer uh, and they're seeing the most hit to rents in the current market. Uh, quality and condition, again, where what where is your property in the market from the, your competitors? Uh, the quality scale, you know, what amenities do you have invest, available in the property or what conveniences for the tenants, safety, security items? And then condition, how well maintained is it? Um, and then market demand and competition, again, you know, T location was not strong last year. Uh, that's starting to come back and we expect that to, you know, the, the market area in Boston to be uh, absorbed going into next year. Uh, your next expense, uh, your next item is expenses and depreciation. So those, you've got your operational and seasonal expenses, landscaping, snow removal, uh, general maintenance items, um, property, the roof, uh, foundation work, infrastructure and structural repairs, um, uh, maintenance systems, so water, plumbing, electrical, uh, water heaters, furnaces, things like that. And then also improvements, so again, depreciable asset uh, investments where you're updating units, adding new amenities, basically anything that would carry over term, and making sure that that's being paid, covered for your increases in rents over an acceptable term of years. Uh, always take into the account the value of the investment you're making and when you're going to recover that investment and then they begin profiting. And then the third item is going to be maintaining tenancy. Uh, outside of repairs, a turnover is going to be your biggest expense. Uh, vacancy obviously is a hit for a month's rent or more, depending on how the market is, as well as brokerage fee, which we're seeing owners paying. Uh, the, about 60% of owners are paying brokerage fees right now. Uh, so that's an additional expense on your uh, income for the year. Uh, we maintain tenancy through open communication with tenants. Again, we look at it from two sets of customers. The owners are our customers and the tenants are our customers. So we want to maintain uh, that perspective. It's, it's your house, it's the tenant's home. And then staying up in, on top of general maintenance. When the tenants report something, getting, in, getting into that right away, uh, letting them know the status when it's being resolved, when somebody's scheduled to come in, especially now with contractors being so busy, getting somebody in if you don't have a set uh, contractor uh, group, uh, it's going to be difficult to get quick responses. And then responding to unplanned events promptly, keeping the tenants up to date on communications, changes at the property. If there's something happening with the city, um, you know, if they're doing any work on the streets, things like that. Uh, so overall, uh, value of property management is going to be the biggest return is your time. And then optimizing your return on your investment. And then continuing to grow your investment by improving the property with market amenities to increase future value. Uh, again, my name is Jamie Thompson. We're at Thompson Realty in Medford, right in Haines Square. Uh, contact information is in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Super valuable information. There we go. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, so as a real estate consultant, my goal is to help you make smart, well-informed decisions around buying and selling your real estate. And even during your ownership, I can help you track your portfolio and maximize your returns. As you plan ahead for exit strategies, I can also advise you on your options there. And just like Jamie um, has, his pulse, has his finger on the pulse of the rental market, um, one of the primary ways I help my clients is by having my finger on the pulse of the market. Over the long term, the real estate market is pretty steady, which is why we like it, but it does change daily as well. Right now, it's especially interesting to see what's going on in this unique situation post-COVID. Um, overall, Freddie Mac, Freddie Mac's new quarterly forecast predicts that the home purchase market will stay strong until um, or through 2021, with sales reaching 6.9 million, up from 6.5 million in 2020. 
and Freddie also expects mortgage rates will rise later this year, but only gradually. And then I'm showing you here the year to date statistics for multifamilies in Massachusetts, um, as well as the year over year change. So as you can see year to date, um, the market is a lot stronger than it was in 2020, which makes sense because this time last year, it was just the beginning of the coronavirus outbreak and things were pretty much in lockdown. So um, we've seen a 48% jump or increase in listings under agreement so far um, for multifamilies and um, over 50% increase in sold listings year to date. And then for the average sale price of multifamilies, we've seen a healthy appreciation of over 6%. About three to 5% is normal. So this is better than the average um, historically, but not as crazy as the appreciation that we've seen in single families, which is closer to 20%. So um, it's definitely healthy and good, um, but not out of control um, like it is for single families right now. So um, for active listings, we have an increase of almost 27% year over year, but still only about 1,200 listings, uh, multifamily listings statewide. So it's a tight inventory for sure. And the month supply of inventory um, is up a little bit, about 2%. So we're seeing um, almost two months supply of inventory. Anything under six months is considered a seller's market. And the average days on market is only 39 days. So the listings that are coming on are getting absorbed pretty quickly. And what I'm seeing from my own client base is that some people are hesitant still to invest right now due to some of the things Jamie was talking about, the rents being um, still a little bit down and um, the eviction moratorium and some uncertainty around this coming year. But then I have other investors who are chomping at the bit and really wanna lock in these ultra low interest rates before they're a thing of the past. So there's definitely um, a lot of buyer demand and not enough listings available to meet the demand right now. By the way, if you're planning to invest or sell in a different market, I mainly serve Greater Boston, but I have a national um, agent referral network and I can connect you to agents all across the country through that network. And also I'm an investor as well. And I certainly understand how important it is to know your numbers and I can help you track your profit and your return on investment and help you navigate towards your goals. Um, I have spreadsheets and calculators I can share with you to streamline your bookkeeping and make sure you're factoring, factoring in all the expenses of ownership so there are no surprises. And with a clear understanding of the financials and the market dynamics, you're prepared to make confident decisions about whether to hold, buy, or sell at any given time. Now, obviously, I think everybody knows it's no secret that the interest rates are low. So even if you're not planning to buy, it might be a good time to refinance your existing properties. You could lower your monthly payment and increase your profit margin, or even pull cash out to buy another property. Um, there might be a wave of foreclosures after um, the pandemic shakes out. Um, so it would be smart to have money available for any opportunities that could come along. Don't wait, do it now because again, interest rates are going up. And of course, there are always things you can do to attract a better caliber of tenant, a better rent. Um, however, you definitely don't wanna over improve for the market, which can be very easy to do. This property is a business, not your home. So every dollar in should give you an exponential return. So depending on whether you want to rent or to sell, either Jamie or I can help you evaluate, evaluate the upgrades you can do to get the biggest bang for your buck. And talking about exit strategies, I know a lot of multifamily owners want to talk about whether they should condo convert. Um, the big ticket condo prices can look pretty attractive. And the thing is often owners don't realize the cost of the renovations it takes to obtain the very high end quality finishes that condo buyers today expect. Therefore, the profit margins can actually be fairly slim relative to the risk of doing a condo conversion. 
The cost of labor and materials has increased a lot in recent years, um, especially this past year due to the growing demand. And 200 to 250 square feet is standard for a high-end condo renovation. Therefore, for a single thousand dollar or a thousand square feet unit, expect to put in at least 200 grand. It will also take on average a year or sometimes a lot longer to um, actually complete the conversion depending on the city or town's regulations. For example, Somerville passed a regulation a few years ago that added various steps to the condo conversion um, process resulting in delaying the condo sales for up to seven years. Sorry about my dog. There must be someone going um, down the street that she's protecting us from. I apologize. I think she's done. Um, so as I was saying, um, it can definitely take a little longer depending on where the um, actual property is and depending on the city's regulations. Um, also, the condo market has cooled off in the past year and no one knows for sure what the market will be like in a year or two. So just wanted you to take all those things into consideration. However, if the numbers work and you do wanna do a condo conversion, just make sure to consult with an agent who knows that market and what today's buyers are looking for because a myriad of questions will come up during the renovation process and one wrong choice could cost you tens of thousands of dollars. Um, one of my clients is doing his third conversion, a five unit condo building right now. And even though it's his third conversion, we're in constant communication about the layout, the parking situation, the finishes and all the selling points that attract or deter buyers. So in property development, having an excellent and trusted team is very critical. But what if you want to sell as is? Well, again, it is a seller's market and this is a great option, um, certainly easier. But if you have um, owned the property for a long time, you may be sitting on a lot of equity, which is great until you see the tax bill. And a great way to minimize tax exposure from a sale is by doing a 1031 like kind exchange. When you sell an investment property, the proceeds of the sale are subject to capital gains tax. And if you're looking at a big profit, that could be a lot of money. The only way to avoid paying taxes altogether, of course, is not to make any money, but you can defer paying taxes on your gains indefinitely by doing a 1031 tax divert exchange. And that means that you reinvest the proceeds or a portion of the proceeds into another real estate investment property. You do have to abide by the strict time frame that the IRS gives, which is 45 days to identify that property and 180 days to close on it. And the best way to do this, in my opinion, is just to list your existing property subject to finding a suitable replacement property. And that takes the time pressure off of you. So my time is up, but if you'd like to set up a needs analysis call or have a market analysis done for your property, just drop me an email or call my cell phone, which is right here. I would love to connect and learn more about your real estate goals. I'm now gonna turn it over to Wolfgang Seitz with Great Point Capital for more information on 1031 exchanges. Thanks, Carrie. Um, let me share my screen. All right, um, thanks again, Carrie, and uh, appreciate being on this call today. Again, my name is Wolfgang Cease. I'm Senior Vice President at Great Point Capital. And who is Great Point Capital? We are a specialist in tax deferral strategies, specifically 1031 exchanges and opportunity zone investing with uh, the brunt of that, the majority of that being 1031 exchanges into Delaware statutory trusts. And we'll talk about that today. 
We'll talk a little bit about the dynamics of doing a 1031 exchange and why you should care. And then we'll go through a, a hypothetical case study and wrap it up at that point. So who is Great Point Capital? We're a boutique investment banking firm established in 2020. We specialize in tax deferral strategies in specifically in real estate. Uh, we also have an investment banking and also a trading operation. So, and who am I? So again, my name is Wolfgang Cease. I manage our New England operations out of Beacon Hill. I call myself a brick and mortar financial advisor as the 99% of my clients are high net worth real estate investors that have done well and they're looking to defer their capital gains. I'm also a, a uh, 1031 expert and deal with 1031 exchanges on a daily basis. I currently am a landlord and have been one for quite some time and also a passive real estate investor in, in multiple development projects across the country. I have also personally done a 1031 exchange myself. So uh, real quick, I'm not going to spend much time on this uh, slide, but as we all know, the commercial real estate environment has blown up, whether it's multifamily developments to industrial uh, assets such as Amazon Distribution Center, et cetera. Real estate prices are at all time highs right now, and um, people are looking to take some chips off the table. Well, what is a 1031 exchange? It's basically a tax ruling that was 100 years ago. We're actually celebrating the 100 year birthday of the like kind exchange. And it basically says that if you are selling a property and uh, with a significant capital gain, you can buy another real property or a Delaware statutory trust. And that's what I do. That, that if it meets certain requirements, you can defer that capital gain and not pay taxes. Why, why should you care about this? And Carrie spoke about this earlier. Here's just a, a quick uh, slide. You know, this person bought this asset for $400,000. They've got $700,000 in gains. If they were to pay taxes, they would walk away with 861,000. This does not include the, um, state income tax, which would knock out another $60,000 or so, depending on your state. So it would actually be closer to 800. So you sell something for 1.1, you walk away with 800, or you, or you do a like kind exchange and you walk away with a 1.1, but you have to invest that into another real property or Delaware statutory trust. <clears throat> so what, what qualifies for an exchange? A rental property, commercial real estate, raw land, business real estate, certain fractional indir indirect ownership interests such as Delaware statutory trusts. So all of those can be exchanged. What does not what this does not include is your personal residence, REITs, stocks, bonds, and property purchase for a resale, like a fix and flip, because these are all long-term capital gains that, that we're looking to defer. As Kerry mentioned, this is the timeline. Day zero is when you close on your sale. Day 45 is when you have to identify your new property and you have to close by day 180. So 135 days from identification to closing. This is a strict timeline. If day 45 is Christmas, then you better have identified it the day before or even I mean, Christmas Eve is a holiday in some, at some firms, so you know the 23rd. If day 45 or day 180 falls on a weekend, you have to have whatever you need done by that Friday, end of business. There's three different things that you need to do when doing a 1031 exchange. One is if you sell a place for a million, you have to buy a place for a million. So you have to replace equal or greater value of what you sold. Secondly, if you have 500, in the same example, if you have $500,000 of equity, you have to invest at least $500,000 of equity into the replacement property. And thirdly, 
you also have to replace debt. And by that, if you've got $500,000 in debt, a mortgage on what you're selling, you have to have at least $500,000 in debt on what you're exchanging into. There are three rules in IDing the property in the first 45 days. The first rule, which is very popular, is the three, the three property rule. And it's just how it sounds. You can identify up to three properties and close on one, two, or all three of them. Very popular ID rule. The second rule is the 200% rule. And that's the one that I see most often. And you can identify any amount of properties as long as they add up to less than 200 or 200% or less of what you're selling. So if you, you're selling a million dollar asset, you can identify up to $2 million worth of property. And the third rule is the 95% rule. I've done, I can't even tell you how many 1031 exchanges I've done for clients. I've never seen this rule in, in, in practice. It is though part of the tax law. So I'm gonna tell you that you can identify any amount of properties, but you have to close on 95% of what you identify. Never seen this in practice, but definitely you can use this if you so want it. I also wanted to point out, which I didn't on the slide before on the timeline, you can never take cons constructive receipt of the funds. So if you're selling that property for a million dollars, it goes to what is called a qualified intermediary, which in California, they call an accommodator. But in, in a nutshell, what that is, it's, an S, it's a person that holds the funds. So you never touch the funds. And then when you when you exchange into the new property, they take your funds and invest it in a new property on your behalf. You cannot take constructive receipt. I see it a few times a year. Somebody will call me and say that they've sold an asset two weeks ago and they've got $630,000 in the bank and they're all excited to do some Delaware statutory trust. Well, I have to break the bad news to them that their exchange is broken because they touched the money and they got a check into their account. So definitely you have to do a little work ahead of time by setting up an accommodator, a qualified intermediary. Very easy to do. They charge a nominal fee, but if you don't do it, your exchange will be broken and not, you won't be able to do exchange. So what is a Delaware statutory trust? This is basically all I do. It is... And I'm going to say in a nutshell again, I don't know why that is on my mind right now, but uh, it is a vehicle that was that came came to light from a 2004 tax ruling that said that if a Delaware statutory trust met certain IRS requirements, there are certain requirements that it has to meet, then it can be a vehicle that accredited investors could exchange into and purchase uh, exchange for um, fractional ownership in an institutional grade asset. So these are institutional grade assets. Right now on our platform, we have everything from a $15 million DST all the way up to a $150 million DST. And the beautiful thing is that if you're doing a an exchange that you need to exchange $400,000. Usually these are uh, $100,000 minimums, but let's say you're doing an exchange for 400 grand and I'm doing an exchange for 12 million. We could both exchange into, let's call it an Amazon distribution facility, a $100 million facility and get treated exactly the same. And at the end of the day, neither of us would be able to purchase that asset on our own. So it's beneficial to the small player and the large player. So, so here's some DST uh, characteristics. As I mentioned, it's passive ownership. You know, it's when you're when you're sick of being a landlord, the tenants trash and toilets. You can go to complete passive ownership here. These are set up to be a preservation of capital that kick off a modest distribution, and they are stabilized assets. You get the benefit from, benefit from the expertise of institutional management and ownership. The debt is non-recourse debt. Again, I wanna repeat that it's non-recourse debt. So if you exchange into one of these DSTs and you're replacing a million dollars of debt with DST debt, you satisfy the IRS requirements for debt replacement, but you also 
free up your balance sheet. That debt is no longer on your balance sheet or your credit report and all things being equal, you could go borrow that million dollars again. You can diversify against diversify with different regions, different geographic regions of the country. And since you can buy small slivers, you could put a little bit here, put a little bit here, put a little bit here, and diversify in different, as I said, geographic regions and sectors. You know, we've got everything, and I'll show you in the next slide from multifamily, class A multifamily, to storage lockers, to, por to portfolios of CVSs and Walgreens, portfolios of grocery center, grocery uh, stores, uh, industrial assets such as Amazon distribution facilities, senior living, student housing, whatever, whatever your fancy is in the commercial real estate world, we probably have a DST to satisfy it. These are not, also these are not blind pools. So these are already stabilized assets that the institution has bought, put debt on and turned into a DST and they're just selling slivers. They're not raising capital. These assets are already purchased. And then lastly, you are not married to the DST structure. You can either, when, when the institution sells the asset, you can exchange into another real property. You can call carry up and buy another apartment building. You could pay your taxes. Or what I would love is that you call me up and do another DST, but uh, you are not married to the structure. Here's a typical Delaware statutory trust. I touched on it uh, a few minutes ago, but this is how they're set up. You would know all the details of the investment ahead of time, type the property, the address, the tenants, the financing terms, the lease terms, the risks. Here's a, a cookie cutter example. The, this uh, institution bought 328 class A multifamily asset. They purchased it for 80 million. They put 40 million of debt, 40 million of equity. They're going to pay out somewhere between four to six percent on a monthly basis, annualized on a monthly basis. And they're going to do some mild uh, cosmetic improvements and, and bring in better management to increase NLI over time. EST investor profile, somebody that's owned appreciated assets, they sold, they'd be uh, subject to a large tax bill. Estate planning, this is great for estate planning. I mean, this is uh, very divisible for an estate. Uh, there's a lot of landlords that are just looking towards retirement, again, sick of the tenants' toilets trash. The, some people are looking for the passion, passive cash flow. And some people might own, a, I'm working with somebody right now that owns like 15, 16 um, apartments or condos in Boston, and they want to just diversify out of Boston. They have all their eggs in one basket in Boston. So Right now, I had a call with him earlier today. He's doing something in Chicago, something in Texas, something in Florida. And lastly, it might be somebody who has no interest in doing this passive investment, but it's day 42 and they know that they can come to me and there's certainty of closing and that I can get them ID'd and closed in a matter of days. This is not a complicated process. It's a security that you're buying into. And conservatively, I can I could uh, get this done via email in two days. Here's just a uh, a hypothetical menu of Delaware statutory trust. You've got everything from triple net property portfolio, distribution centers, self storage, corporate headquarters, medical office properties. We've got quite a lot of those right now, and pharma manufacturing facilities. Student housing, class A multifamily, senior living, basically anything you can think of, we've got it. Lastly, um, I'm going to go through a quick investor case study. This was an investor down in Florida, <clears throat> married couple in their 70s. The husband had a, a health scare. They got one child in, in their in his 50s and uh, and a grandchild in college. They've amassed a hundred million dollar real estate portfolio. They developed, managed this portfolio themselves. Their only child, the child that's in his fifties has absolutely no interest in being in property management. And they just received a compelling offer on one of their uh, assets. And they know that it would be a, a massive tax bill. 
So this is the portfolio we put together for, for this couple. It spreads it around between, you know, eight different asset types, sectors in different geographic regions of the country. We've matched their equity at 9.5 million. We've matched their debt at 11, 11, 250,000. And this portfolio gave a very nice blended yield to the investor, a diversified blended yield. And everybody was happy. And again, my name is Wolfgang Cease. I'm the Senior Vice President of Great Point Capital. I'd like to also thank Carrie again for putting this together. And when you're doing large transactions like this, it is of the utmost importance that you have a good solid team around you. Without a good team, something can fall, something can easily fall apart. Your exchange can be in jeopardy. Your property purchase can be in jeopardy. Everybody on this call is best in class. And again, you know, you need to have a solid team on your side when doing a large transaction like this. Anyway, thank you for your time today and please feel free to reach out with any questions. So Wolfgang, do you want to stop sharing your screen and I'll share mine? Well, I'll go ahead and talk about Wolfgang when you have a chance. So thank you. Great. Um, I apologize about that. I'm better at 1031 exchanges than uh, <laughs> computer computers. Thank you, Wolfgang. My name is Emily Clare, and I'm a financial advisor at Edward Jones. And what I do is I help clients who want to look at their whole financial picture. So your real estate investments are part of your big financial picture. And what I try to get to know is why why are you doing everything you want? What is it you want out of your life financially? And I really try to coordinate all of the members of your team to help you achieve those goals and to help you with both your investments and your protection and your financial plan. So when you think about what's most important to you, here are some things that often come to mind. Preparing for retirement, living in retirement, paying for education, preparing for the unexpected, and planning your estate or inheritance. So uh, whether you know preparing for retirement means amassing real estate that you're gonna live off and you're gonna live off the income or maybe do a DST, you always wanna have some liquid investments as part of that to diversify how you invest. So I can help you come up with some, you know, maybe stock and bond, mutual fund, ETF portfolios that would coordinate with your long-term goals for investing, and also make sure you have enough emergency cash on hand to accomplish the goals and plan for, you know, let's say you're planning to buy another property, help you uh, project the plans that you need to make in order to accomplish the shorter term goals as well. So preparing for retirement, uh, you can go from everything from a non-qualified account to an IRA. Uh, or uh, if you have a business, you can even set up a 401k plan or something like that. And I help with all of those. Uh, and then um, as you're transitioning, this transition from preparing for retirement to living in retirement is really a critical time. And so I can help you protect your assets from a, a sudden market downturn during this really important time and help you think about whether you will have enough to live on. And if you're planning to cash out a property and invest in regular investments, I can help you with that part. Or if you just need to project out, you know, will you have enough income with your real estate? I can help you with that. So I, I help with the financial plan and then I help with the liquid investments, both preparing for and living in retirement. I also do some insured products like annuities, which are sort of like real estate and they provide uh, some income for, their, for your life. Uh, then when it comes to paying for education, uh, so that's usually a uh, tax sheltered account called 529 plan is the most popular, but there are other ways to do this as well. 
And what I can do is help you determine how much do you need to save a month to have your child go to the school of your choice or your grandchild. Uh, so we can even pick out the school and figure out how much your monthly cost would be to save for that plan. And then preparing for the unexpected, I think, you know, we talked about that earlier with Jamie. It's so important to have uh, emergency cash when you have properties, uh, when you have yourself, your family. And so that's one of the critical pieces I always talk about. Also, if you have other, you know, these um, mortgages or dependents or, or any other business partners, I can help you with life insurance. It can be a buy-sell agreement for a business partnership. It could be a key person agreement for a business, or it can be for yourself. It can be a term, term policy or a permanent policy. Uh, so anything is protecting that. And then I also have disability and long-term care planning as well. And then when it comes to planning your estate or inheritance, I make sure that that is front and center. And I don't let you forget this important piece. And I will make sure that you connect with um, either somebody that you're working with, or I can help you connect with somebody like I've partnered with Sarah Hartline, who's gonna speak next on estate planning. And I can assure you that, uh, you know, this is a really critical piece that a lot of people don't wanna think about. I will help you think about that. I'll make sure you have beneficiaries on your accounts. So that's the kind of work that I do. I'm really looking at the big picture. Your real estate investments are part of the big picture and I help put that into context with everything else and really focus on the why. Why are you wanting to accomplish these goals? Uh, and what is it you want to get out of it? So uh, what's your vision for the future and how can I help you get there? Uh, so the process I follow is a five-step process. We start with understanding where you are now and then look at where you would like to be. And then uh, it's kind of a gap analysis. So I then go back and look and see if this is a feasible goal and help you come up with strategies to achieve that goal. Uh, and then after that, uh, we can partner together to help you stay on track and that's with regular reviews and updates. If something changes in your life, we can have a conversation. So if you are interested in exploring this process with me, uh, that's the process I use to onboard prospective clients and I am accepting new clients. Or if you know somebody who needs this kind of help, I'm happy to talk to them. Uh, and then I'm just gonna skip over the details, but there's lots of details. Uh, and then just returning back to the team. So you're in the center of a team. Uh, I am, I'm here as a financial advisor. Laura is my team member here in the branch. She's a branch office administrator. And then there's the Edward Jones home office. I am licensed. I, I'm mostly working in the greater Boston area. I am licensed in some other states, including Colorado and California, uh, Maine, uh, New Hampshire. Uh, but also if you said, well, I'm looking for a financial advisor more local to me, Edward Jones has an excellent network of financial advisors and I'll, I'll um, reflect back what Carrie just said. Uh, and then um, partnering with your legal and tax professionals. So that would be Sarah, uh, it would be your CPA, uh, people that will help you finish the plan. I'm gonna help you make sure you get connected with the people you need to. Uh, and our home office is doing research on the investments and on the best play, way to adjust to the market. So, you know, my value proposition is I want to understand what's most important to you. And then we'll use an established process to build personalized strategies to help you achieve your goals. And then we'll partner together throughout your life to help you keep on track. Uh, one other thing I just want to throw up here on the screen is here is my contact information. I also put it in the chat, but feel free to take a quick screenshot of that. I'm happy to have a conversation, even if you just want a consultation, I'm happy to do that for you. Thanks so much, my name is Emily Clare. I am now going to pass it over to Sarah Hartline, estate planning attorney, who I have partnered with for clients uh, needs, and here she is. Great, thank you, Emily. I am going to pull up my presentation. So let me see if I can screen share. Perfect. I can and great. 
Great. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know it's been a lot of information today, and um, I always enjoy this presentation because I feel like every time I learn a little bit more, more information from the other professionals here. Um, I'm an estate planning attorney, as uh, Emily mentioned, with Mark Olson Bloom, and I'm going to be rounding out the program today with a discussion on estate planning and how that fits into being an absentee landlord. So if you already have estate planning documents, we do generally recommend uh, as estate planners that you review your plan every five years or anytime you have any sort of major life transition. So buying or selling real estate is certainly one of those important events. Um, and in, in addition, re reviewing your estate plan regularly is important, even if you're not buying or selling, uh, just because you wanna ensure um, that the property is going to be passing to your intended beneficiaries and that you're also meeting other potential goals during life, such as asset protection or reduction of taxes. So one uh, major part of estate planning, and I think um, Emily touched on this, the importance not just of you know, investing your, uh, your assets wisely, but also doing sort of that maintenance of making sure that you have the right beneficiaries on your accounts, um, uh, making sure things are titled properly. If you do have a trust, making sure that your assets are titled into the name of the trust. So those are things that your estate planner and your financial advisor can, certainly can work together on. Um, and also certainly another reason to be checking in periodically on your plan um, to make sure that all of that uh, is in place and in the right way um, that it needs to be. So that you do have that clear plan in terms of how assets are going to be passed on and managed by the next generation. So I talked, so yes, so talking a little bit in terms of titling property, the importance of doing that um, in the right way, and also in terms of, actually, sort of skipped ahead, let me go back one. If I can figure out how to do that. Um, maybe not. Go back a slide, but um, so we'll stick with this one. So, um, so yeah. So, like I said, you know, important for titling um, purposes, um, and then in terms of the actual asset protection, um, generally you have um, two different options in terms of how to title real estate if it's not being titled in your name um, for rental properties. Usually, it's an LLC or a trust. So, um, and this is something where even um, unfortunately for someone with rental properties, they might not realize that um, insurance is not always enough to cover, you know, if there is some type of a lawsuit. And so this is why often these LLCs and trusts um, are a good option. Um, so in terms of the difference between LLCs and trusts for someone with income producing property, um, an LLC does typically make the most sense um, because it can protect personal assets from lawsuits. Um, also, LLCs can also offer owners privacy since the property can be listed in the company's name. Trusts are typically more common for property that you don't rent out. Um, however, many property owners ultimately decide to use a combination of LLCs and trusts. So the LLC can actually be owned by one or more trusts. Um, uh, and so again, that would be something that you could um, explore with an estate planning attorney. So here I have some of the steps that are listed, uh, steps listed for the process of creating an LLC or a trust. Um, and I think, you know, we're sort of running out of time. So just sort of quickly, just sort of the most important thing to remember is just to set it up, at, not only to set it up, but also to doing the ongoing administrative work of administering it correctly. Um, otherwise, the protections can be lost um, if, um, if you aren't doing that. And um, again, just sort of big picture, um, I do always encourage whenever you are talking about real estate, um, that one size does not fit all. Um, as I mentioned, there are, you know, the decision, decision between LLC versus trust. Um, there's different um, considerations in terms of what your plans are for the property. Um, if you do intend, for example, for this to stay in the property, stay in um, the family for generations um, versus um, there's a likelihood of selling in the near future that can factor into decisions such as, um, you know, analyzing capital gains, um, tax implication, estate tax implications. Um, and so it really is um, a matter of, of looking at your specific situation, looking at, at all the different factors um, and, and determining what works um, for you and your family. 
And so the other thing I just wanted to briefly mention is in terms of estate planning during COVID, um, our office, like many other offices, um, we are able to operate virtually. Um, and it's actually a great time I found that of now, even within the past year, because we are doing more Zoom meetings with clients, because people are becoming more you know, familiar and comfortable with that, that we can often have that, um, you know, three or four members of a, of a family on a call to discuss um, these items. I know it's not something that's, you know, always pleasant or exciting to do um, in terms of getting the family together, um, but it's certainly important um, as somebody who does do um, both the planning and the litigation side, um, I can see how things can, can, quickly, um, can quickly go wrong without proper planning. So here's my contact information. I have my phone number, I have my email. Um, feel free to reach out if you have questions. Um, uh, even if you're not sure if I'm the right person to be talking to, happy to, happy to speak with you and point you in the right direction. And so I will pass it back to Kerry. I think uh, you might have some sure. wrap up thoughts. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone and it is one o'clock on the dot, but um, if anybody has some questions, please go ahead, unmute yourself and ask your question or put it in the chat. Um, oh, there's a question here. So um, for, for Wolfgang, I believe this would be the best question. Um, is there a minimum investment for DSTs? So I'll, I will say that the state at minimum on most DSTs is a, is a hundred thousand dollars. I've actually had a deal where I was the backup on a million dollar transaction recently, and he uh, ended up doing had thirty seven thousand dollars left over, and just due to my relationships, I was able to get that done. Uh, also, I would like to point out that. DST investing is for accredited investors and that in that simply states that you are worth over a million dollars excluding your primary residence or you've made over $200,000 a year. The previous two years with an expectation of that moving forward or $300,000 for a married couple. But yes, the state at minimum is $100,000 but I can always work with that. So feel free to reach out by all means. Great, thank you. And also Yvonne asked, what fees do property managers charge on average in the Metro Boston area? And I know that Jamie had to jump off a little early. So um, that I do know it depends on, you know, the scope of services and there are different options there. So what I would encourage you to do is just reach out to Jamie. In fact, all of us give, you know, free consultations. So um, in a lot of these, things are specific to your situation. So feel free to reach out. Don't be shy. Um, we can also do Zoom if that works better. Um, but yeah, I never like to quote other people's fees. So I'll let Jamie tell you to shoot him an email or give him a call. And again, I will send out an email with a link to the recording as well as everyone's contact information. And we would really love to hear from you um, and see if we can help or put you in touch with someone else who can. Any other questions before we sign off today? Awesome. Well, thank you so much to the panel. Um, you guys are amazing and I'm happy that you are on my team. And um, I definitely encourage everyone to um, build your team out with these people today. So thank you so much for your time and have a great, wonderful day. Have a great day. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. You're so welcome.